There have been a lot of Mega Man games. In the classic series alone, it is 12 main games and a ton of spin-offs. But when thinking about the core entries of the classic Mega Man saga, one title frequently comes up when people think of the absolute worst one, Mega Man and Base, a game that was a Japanese exclusive for the Super Nintendo in 1998. It was given a worldwide audience on the Game Boy Advance in 2003. But what makes this game so bad? And why was the Super Nintendo game released when the PlayStation and Nintendo 64 were well into their life cycles? And almost on their way out, no less. All this will be answered as I tell you why I think Mega Man and Base is a pretty fun action platformer. But before I even think about it, we've got to discuss how Mega Man is a pretty heroic guy, am I right? And to celebrate said heroism, I've decided to partner up with Marvel Strike Force to be the sponsor of today's video. Marvel Strike Force is a squad-based RPG for mobile devices where you assemble a team of your favorite superheroes and supervillains in a battle to save the universe from the likes of Apocalypse or Doctor Doom. Using your favorite characters, you complete missions, unlock new equipment and resources to level up, and then you compete with other players in PvP modes like the Arena. If you're a new player, you can unlock up to 17 characters within your first 30 days, like Spider-Man, Deadpool, or Captain America. When I started the game, I got Spider-Man and unlocked Luke Cage within minutes. A pretty cool team-up. And then you spend your time recruiting more famous heroes and villains along the way. New characters are regularly added, too. With this game, you'll experience all kinds of fascinating tidbits in the Marvel Universe in the story mode, with great visuals, too. So if all that sounds interesting to you, which I know it does, you'd best install the game today and unlock Wolverine for free using this month's limited-time promo code, LOGAN alongside 100 Wolverine shards, 500 power cores, and 5 premium orbs. And for a limited time this month, if you use the QR code or click the link in the description, you can also celebrate Pride Month by unlocking Marvel's LGBT heroes like Korg and America Chavez, completely for free simply by logging into the game this month. Thanks again to Marvel Strike Force for sponsoring this video. Now with all that said, we may now return to the regularly scheduled programming. So what is the situation with this game? It goes back to what I was saying at the start of my video on Mega Man 6. That game was released in Japan well into the SNES's lifespan, because in Japan, older hardware has a longer lifespan. Mega Man 8 released on the PlayStation and Sega Saturn in 1996 and 1997, respectively. It had colorful, flashy, 32-bit graphics that were the best the series had seen up to that point. But by 1998, there were still a lot of kids in Japan who didn't have a PlayStation or a Sega Saturn and were still playing games on their Super Famicoms. Series producer Keiji Inafune felt like it was worth making another game for the console to make sure these fans didn't miss out. Using a team of old and new staff, Rockman and Forte, or Mega Man and Base, was born. It is a game that uses a lot of Mega Man 8 assets to create a new 16-bit entry with gameplay concepts both old and new. Evidently, the team had a lot of fun working on this one. Inafune directed them to make it tough as nails as well, which is funny because the idea was that this game was for the younger fans with no PS1. It's like, oh yeah kids, you'll get a Mega Man game. And it will be the most difficult one yet. And that's the game's backstory in a nutshell. There was still an audience for Mega Man and the Super Famicom, and they decided to capitalize. Mega Man games are also pretty cheap, so it's a win-win. I don't think the game was ever intended for an international audience when it was first made because the Super Nintendo was not a commercially relevant console in 1998 and had not been for years. It was all about the PS1 and the N64 in the US. That's probably why the game didn't have a number on it. That, and possibly because they didn't want to have Mega Man 8 as the next generation sequel and then have Mega Man 9 look like a comparative downgrade. Which is kind of ironic given the Mega Man 9 that we got, but that's a story for another day. Fast forward a couple of years and it's the early 2000s. Nintendo's handheld machine is the Game Boy Advance, which, fun fact, was my very first video game device. My first console was the PlayStation 2. Specifically, I had a red GBA SP. The main upgrade the SP had was the backlit screen. Looking back on this thing, it's insane to see that it launched for $99, which is $166 in today's money. Crazy that high quality hardware could be so cheap once upon a time. But anyway, the GBA was so great because the games on it were roughly around the quality of the Super Nintendo from 10 years prior, a showing of how quickly handheld gaming was starting to catch up with consoles. On the Game Boy Advance, Nintendo ported a lot of SNES games, so this is what Capcom decided to do. Mega Man and Base was given a GBA port in Japan in 2002, and that was translated and released worldwide in 2003 as a part of Mega Man's 15th anniversary celebration. Unfortunately, it's not very good. Now, the port job is fine. 
The game runs well and looks nice. The music was kind of butchered, but the game plays the same on Game Boy Advance as it did on Super Nintendo. However, there's one glaring issue with it and it was unavoidable. The difference in resolution between the SNES and GBA ruins the game. As you can see on the screen, the SNES's resolution gives you a pretty clear view of what's happening on the screen most of the time. When you take that game and put it on a console with a lower resolution with a smaller screen, sacrifices had to be made. So the game zooms in on the action so you can still see Mega Man or Base on the small screen. This makes it really difficult to see what's going on. Many GBA ports have this issue, but in a slower paced game like Zelda or whatever, you could reasonably get away with it, even if it's not the game's best version. Mega Man and Base is a fast paced platformer designed to be difficult. Losing this much visibility is a major hindrance. I don't know if it's unplayable, I didn't beat the game on GBA, but frequently it was very difficult to see what was coming. I can't imagine what it would be like if I hadn't already played the game before. But that begs the question, what do you do if you want to play Mega Man and Base now? This GBA version is the only officially localized version that exists. It was given a release on the Wii U, in fact. Besides that, the game has not seen much action when it comes to re-releases. It was a huge missed opportunity on Capcom's part to not translate the original version for the Mega Man Legacy Collection 2 in 2017, which only had four games. MM and B would have bumped it up to a nice five games. So what do you do if you want to play the game in its original form, but in English? Well, fans have had the answer to this for a long time. You simply take the Japanese ROM from your legally obtained Super Famicom cartridge, download the translation patch on romhacking.net, apply it, load it up on an emulator. Most importantly, don't ask me how to do any of that, and bam, Mega Man and Base. If you want an authentic experience, though, the second-hand market will provide. It was my first trip to the Too Many Games convention in 2015 when I got my hands in this reproduction card of Mega Man and Base, the fan-translated game just in a cartridge you can play on a real SNES. It lets you imagine what it would have been like if the game was on the SNES. And in the spirit of that, I decided to go the full mile. I have these uniform cases for my loose cartridge-based games where I print out the cover and all that. By the time this game was in the West, they had stopped making US specific art and just used the amazing Japanese art. This is a good thing, but I wanted to see what Mega Man and Base would look like if it had the Mega Man 6 or 7 US art style. So I contacted Spring Queen, an amazing artist in the Mega Man community, to draw it for me. The art of Mega Man and Base is featured in the thumbnail as well. The cover art came out fantastic and looks great when printed out in the box. The link to her Twitter page will be in the description. But yeah, playing this game on an SNES, this is how the game was meant to be played and seen. Though that hasn't really done wonders for the game's reputation nevertheless. One might think this game is known as a super tough and frustrating game because of the GBA port. However, on YouTube and the internet at large, the game is still considered one of the worst Mega Man games for being frustrating and unforgiving, just playing it on SNES, the GBA port only making it worse. Speaking for myself, I was always kind of interested in this game. I had never even heard of it before YouTube, and I thought the story behind it was really intriguing. I only learned then that it was a bad game. But ever since I first played it on SNES, I always liked it. For a while, it seemed like I was the only one. I did a Let's Play of Bases story on my LP channel back in 2016, but besides that old fossil I deleted, I never gave my thoughts on this game again. Don't even fact check that, we all know I can't possibly be lying. It's been many years since I last played this game, so I was excited to go back to it and give my updated thoughts. Before I continue though, this video may be labeled as a defense, but it must be said that this is not a hit piece on anybody or a response video of any kind. I'll talk about it more at the end, but I just want to say now at the beginning that I don't really care what anybody else thinks. Not in a dismissive way, but in a, this show is about my opinion on the game and I thought it was good, so I'm going to say why. People are free to not like it. Doesn't really matter to me one way or another. So, let's dive in. Similar to Mega Man X4, you either pick Mega Man or Base at the start and play the entire game as them. Since Mega Man is the title character, I opted to pick him first. In the intro stage, you'll learn that the leading philosophy of Mega Man and base level design is that patience is a virtue. Whether it be fireballs that rise from the lava or come out of tubes on the ground, getting through this level unscathed and the whole game will require patience and observation. Skills the classic Mega Man series revolves around in general, but this game has it more than most, like this enemy at the end. If you just jump, you'll be hit by its attack or the enemy itself, fall back into the pit and die. You have to wait for its attack to complete and then it, for some reason, walks itself into the abyss. 
giving you the chance to move forward without taking damage. The setting of the intro stage is the Robot Museum from Mega Man 7. This time, a robot called King has decided he's sick of robots fighting each other over humans and it's time to start something new. So he's grabbing some bots from the Robot Museum to start his army, consisting of Cold Man, Burner Man, Pirate Man, Ground Man, Tengu Man, returning from Mega Man 8, Magic Man, Astro Man, also from Mega Man 8, and Dynamo Man. Whether playing as Mega Man or base, you'll find Proto Man taking on King, to limited success. Mega Man or base having to battle the Green Devil while King makes his escape. Mega Man is obviously going to fight King and his robot masters because that's what he does, but Base needs to stop King in order to prove himself as the strongest robot, and that's basically it for the plot. The Green Devil was a boss from the endgame of Mega Man 8, and here it is in Mega Man and Base. It is legitimately very impressive just how many assets from Mega Man 8 are reused in Mega Man and Base. Mega Man's sprites are obviously the ones from Mega Man 8, but then so many assets from that game are used in pretty clever new ways, where you might not even notice it while playing. Like how they brought back the bubble segment from Mega Man 8's Tengu Man stage, but then repurposed it to be underwater for Pirate Man's level in this game. The trains and the swinging enemies and rising platforms from Clown Man's stage are all over Magic Man's stage. As is the gimmick of timing your movement to a bell in the background. The flying whale enemy from Frost Man's stage is swimming towards you in Pirate Man's stage. The ice projectiles from Frost Man stage are found in Cold Man stage in this one. Not a single good asset from Mega Man 8 didn't find its way into Mega Man and base somewhere, and for a game on weaker hardware, emulating the look and feel of a PS1 game deserves some serious props. Aesthetically, I think this game is gorgeous for SNES standards, and the music is just stellar in this one. I don't usually do the whole play music for the viewer to hear what I mean thing anymore, but in this game, I can make the exception. I think this is one of my favorite Mega Man soundtracks of all time. Stages have really catchy composition, high quality sound for SNES, and can sometimes be really serene and atmospheric. It's great background noise when doing projects, and I also like to use this music in videos a lot. It's easily my favorite soundtrack in the classic Mega Man series. So what is this game like once you properly get into it? If you play it as Mega Man, things will be pretty predictable. In this game, Mega Man plays exactly how he did in Mega Man 8. That should be expected given that it's all the same animation, you know, you jump, shoot, slide, charge your shots, all the good stuff. I thought Mega Man handled really well in Mega Man 8 and I think it's the same quality in Mega Man and base. The series has reached a point now where you can just say, it's the same as all the rest and it can be an accurate statement. It's playing as base which is the headline feature. They wanted him to feel unique to play as, so he's not a skin swap of Mega Man, he's totally different. For starters, base can double jump. This is a godsend in platforming as you can correct any mistake that Mega Man just can't. For base's movement, they lifted the core mechanic from the Mega Man X series, dashing. By pressing the A button or double tapping the D-pad in whatever direction you're facing, you accelerate forward and can combine that with the double jump for some really impressive movement by classic Mega Man standards. I do have a nitpick with it though. In Mega Man X, the dash was also mapped to the A button by default, which was the rightmost face button. In every Mega Man X game, it was mapped to the rightmost face button. But in all of those games, you could reconfigure the buttons to your liking. Dashing is far more comfortable on one of the shoulder buttons, something I learned when I first played Mega Man Zero, which had it there by default. Dashing with the rightmost face button isn't bad, it's just not my preference anymore. Mega Man in base doesn't let you change the controls at all, so you have to play it that way. And I had to play it that way because this footage was definitely obviously recorded on real hardware, am I right? In combat, base is very different from Mega Man. As the titular hero, you can only fire three shots from the Mega Buster at once, and they only go straight. The base buster cannot charge its attack, but it can shoot as many shots as you want and can be fired in eight directions. You also can't move while shooting. The trade-off with Mega Man and base is that the former is a less mobile character and is much stronger in combat because the charge shot is much more powerful than anything base can do, but as base you're much more mobile and have more range in attacking, but with less power. In this game, the progression system is a bigger shakeup than what Mega Man 7 and 8 did. In those games, they took the boss roster from being 8 stages you could pick from into 2 sets of 4. Mega Man and base has this grid where only 3 bosses are active at once. Cold Man, Astro Man, and Ground Man. I think this was an attempt at introducing more non-linearity into the game. 
as beating Cold Man, for example, unlocks Burner Man and Pirate Man. Beating Astro Man unlocks Pirate Man, Dynamo Man, and Tangu Man. Then beating Ground Man unlocks Tangu Man and Magic Man. In theory, this could lead to more strategy, like if I wanted to play Dynamo Man early, but to do that you have to play the stage that gives you his weakness, Astro Man. But in practice, it doesn't really amount to much. This game doesn't have the kind of item hunting in it that previous games or the Mega Man X games had, where I think the system might have been more interesting. But here, it's little more than an experimental concept. Cold Man is the best pick for an easy first boss as both characters, but since this game is known for how hard it is, I wanted to go against the mold. Keeping in mind that I haven't played this in years, and I was starting out as Mega Man, the character that's considered significantly more challenging to beat the game as. So I picked Astro Man first, just to see what it would be like. I wanted to see if I was missing something here when I said it was good years ago. As Mega Man, I really didn't have an issue with the level. The enemies are easy to see coming, and if you've played the previous games, you'd know to take it slow in a section like this one where they jump from the screen in the background. I did die to the rising block section in the middle, but that was it. This level features the disappearing and reappearing block gimmick that is in just about every classic Mega Man, but I think it's pretty tame in this one. But if you play as Mega Man, you will run into a problem where there's no avoiding it either. In all the other games, there was some tool you could use to avoid this section entirely, like the Magnet Beam in Mega Man 1 or the Rush Jet in Mega Man 3. Though, if it's a design concept so bad that you need a way to just skip it, maybe it was never really a good idea to begin with. I thought the one in Mega Man 2 was much more punishing since I cleared this one first try. Astro Man's boss fight was the true test, though. I've mentioned in the past that I'm the kind of player who likes to go on the attack, so when I was fighting Astro Man with no weakness, I got my butt kicked because I kept flailing around trying to hit him as often as I could, but the strategy that really paid off after I died the first time was instead reacting to whatever attack was coming in and hitting him whenever I knew I had an open shot. I then learned the pattern, saw when he was open, and knew when he was invulnerable, and had a good time with the fight. That boss gave me some confidence, so I went to Ground Man next. I had the same thoughts throughout this stage. When I tried to play on defense, I had an easier time with it. The mini boss is a little too much health for my liking, but it also went down pretty simply. I like this series of puzzle rooms where you destroy these statues, which force a wall of spikes to get closer to you and you need to strategize which statues to destroy to get through the room. If you have the wave burner weapon, the second room can be cheesed by destroying the door opening statue with the weapon. But either way, I thought it was a neat obstacle to overcome. As Mega Man, the final room will really test you. Using your charge shots on the little guys before they destroy the ground is imperative. Then I tend to damage boost through the Sniper Joe if I have the health. Finally, the boss fight was like Astro Man in that I got through it just by focusing on dodging attacks. That's the dichotomy of Mega Man and Base in this game. If you like to go on the attack and brute force your way through games, which I often do, Base is the character to play as. It's why I gravitated towards him in earlier playthroughs. Sometimes they'll even design different segments for these abilities, like how Base has to go through an upper route at the start of Pirate Man stage with his double jump, while Mega Man has to go below with the slide. But what I'm getting at is that cheesing the platforming as Base is a lot of fun to do, but I just want to give Mega Man's run more credit this time. A perfect stage to show this off is Magic Man's. The beginning of this level is pretty tough as Mega Man. You'll need to ride the train cars and destroy the enemies with the right timing or you'll fall off and die. There's an extra life here so you have as many chances as you need to do it. But as base, you can dash double jump through it pretty effortlessly. The enemies are no problem thanks to base's range and the platforming is pretty trivial. For that reason, I think base is quite fun to play as in this game, but if I'm honest, I think the game is better balanced when playing as Mega Man. That's the last thing I thought I'd be saying about this game upon the replay, but I think it's true. Playing as Mega Man first helped me see that. As base, there are countless stage segments you can easily bypass. The spikes of Cold Man stage, the bubble section and Pirate Man stage, the balloon section of Tengu Man stage, the ending of Ground Man stage, and the list goes on. There are segments you can't do that with, like the dark part of Dynamo Man stage, but still, as Mega Man, I saw a diverse roster of stages and was able to get through them and thought it was really satisfying. When I played as base, I dash jumped over a lot of stuff and used the treble boost to fly right past the block section of Astro Man. Now that's not me saying the level design is perfect when not using base. In the second section of Tengu Man stage, there are a few too many leaps of faith for my liking. Base makes those much more approachable. And then Burner Man stage felt like a gauntlet with enemies and hazards everywhere. I think it's all mostly well telegraphed, but then at the end when you need to move quickly or get burned by these enemies dropping firebombs, it could be a bit too much and you might get a game over here and have to play the stage again. But I'm saying that for most of the levels, I thought Mega Man was a fun challenge. With Mega Man, I was able to experiment with the boss order because boss fights as him are balanced. You get decent damage done with the charge shot and can easily avoid attacks by sliding. 
as base. Trying to do anything other than the weakness order is a death sentence. The default base buster just does not do enough damage on bosses. Dashing and double jumping also is more cumbersome when trying to avoid damage for most of these encounters. I played Dynamo Man stage as base and actually ran out of the weakness ammo and died. I had to try fighting him with the base buster and I was trapped here until I got a game over. The lightning attack was unpredictable and hard to dodge, getting shots in while being unable to move was an issue, the boss regains his health towards the end and I just did not think base is equipped to deal with it, but Mega Man was. So I think the player gets a better platforming experience as Mega Man and then you can tackle bosses buster only as him too. But it's also nice that the really tough stages and bosses, Burner Man and Dynamo Man can only be unlocked by beating the bosses that give you their weaknesses. And in general, I thought bosses were well handled regarding weaknesses. Too often, bosses are just easy to stun loop with their weakness, and I've hammered on about this for years. But Mega Man and Base, for the most part, handles this pretty well. Ground Man is weak to Pirate Man's remote mine, but he has attacks that are immune to any weapon, including the weakness, so you have to dodge the attack where he goes back and forth. With Burner Man, there's a cool gimmick where you need to use the ice wall to push him into the spikes on either end of the arena. The Magic card doesn't do a supremely high amount of damage on Astro Man, but you can use it to destroy his clones. The copy vision prevents Dynamo Man from using his electricity attack. There are more examples here, but I really appreciate how the bosses make you put the work in, even if you have the weakness. The weakness weapon gives you an edge, not a win button. I still think Dynamo Man is a pain in the ass with his regaining health move, and Tengu Man is reduced to nothing by his weakness, but I don't think the rest are. It's just nice to see a Mega Man game that shows off the kind of design I'd like to see with these weakness weapons when I normally spend so long criticizing these games for how they handle it. Outside of bosses, I really like how integrated the special weapons are into the level design. This went for both characters, but especially as Mega Man. Since base can dash and double jump, Mega Man's only way to compete with that in later levels is using the ice wall. You can ride on top of it once you push it, and you're going to have to do that a lot as Mega Man. Many enemies will be easier to kill if you have the remote mine as you can aim it. The magic card grabs items out of reach, and the wave burner also does good chip damage while interacting with the environment to detonate explosives, melt ice, move spike balls out of the way while underwater, and so on. Whether you're Mega Man or base, you'll probably be using your special weapons a lot. And you get to put that to the test towards the end of the game. Once you've beaten all eight stages, you unlock the Crystal Gate stage. Since the special weapons are essential to beating the final stages, this level is a test where you have to be able to use all your special weapons to advance, just to make sure you know how they work. Each room rewards you with 100 bolts that you use in the shop system, which is a perfectly great segue into that shop system. The shop in Mega Man and Base is a nice middle ground between what Mega Man 7 and 8 did. Like Mega Man 8, you buy a lot of useful upgrades that enhance the player character's default abilities, like charging faster for Mega Man, receiving less damage for both, the energy balancer, or an upgrade to the base buster that makes it three times as powerful. Many of these aren't worth buying, like protection from spike damage or climbing up ladders faster, but the ones that are worth buying are game changers. It takes what works from Mega Man 7, because the bolts are back to the system from that game where they drop from enemies, and you can get up to 999 of them at a time and buy extra lives and such, but also the useful player upgrades from Mega Man 8. There are still no E-Tanks in this game, but you take whatever advantage you can get. But once all that is done, it's time for King's Fortress, a pretty infamous final set of levels among all Mega Man fans. Well, before I even comment on the actual stage, I have to first say, the music here totally didn't need to go this hard, but it definitely is one of my favorite tracks in the game, like, what a bop this one is. Looking past that, what is wrong with this level? For starters, the ammo you used up in the crystal stage is still drained when you start this level, so you need to shoot these flying enemies to get it all back, which is why you'd want to get the energy balancer from the shop, so that the ammo drops automatically refill the weapons you have the least ammo for. That's lousy design right from the beginning, because these games stopped doing the whole do the fortress on one ammo pool thing several games ago. But other than that, I think King Fortress 1 is fine. I mean to say, if you made it this far, you should be able to beat this level without much hassle arising from it because it mostly just brings back stage hazards from previous levels. The real kick to the nuts in this stage is the boss fight. You stand on this platform, and when you do, it lowers into the lava, but when the platform is lower, the boss's weak spot is lifted. So the challenge is getting the platform low enough to where you can hit the boss without dying from the lava while avoiding its attacks, and this random ass monkey flinging attacks too. Perhaps this is a little much for one boss, but the ultimate beginner's trap is when you win. You have to immediately get off the platform or it will fall into the lava and you die. Which is, like I said, nothing more than a beginner's trap. 
That level is relatively harmless though. It's King Fortress 2 that gets all the ire and for good reason. This level is just too damn long for its own good. I don't mind the parts where you attack and avoid enemies. It puts your weapons to good use, you know, all the stuff you'd expect from a good fortress stage. Where this level really goes wrong is at the bosses. About a quarter of the way through, you face a tank that goes back and forth with a weak spot on the front, the back, and the top. Getting through this will consume a lot of your remote mine, lightning bolt, and copy vision ammo, but it's doable. Then the level just keeps going until you fight the King Jet, platform suspended over a bottomless pit and a jet going up and down with every attack under the sun, like a blinding flash bomb obscuring your vision, an AoE laser attack, and a punch that destroys whatever platform it touches. As base, this is easier because of the double jump, but as Mega Man, if you get the punch attack at the wrong time, you're basically screwed. The designers knew that because there's an extra life right before this, essentially giving you infinite tries, which I also wouldn't mind if the boss didn't go on so long with no health bar to indicate how well you're doing. And if the level ended here, I still wouldn't have a big issue with it, but then that just leads to another section which leads to the battle with King. I don't like this boss because it starts with a phase where King is completely immune to damage and you just wait through these flying X's. Hopefully you don't take a lot of damage in the process or you'll die to the actual King Phase 1 and have to do it again. Mercifully, there's a checkpoint after King Phase 1, making Phase 2 really easy, but was that not a tad bit much for one stage? This level also reveals the shocking twist that Dr. Wily built King. I know, I know, you didn't see it coming, but Wily just got sick of base getting beat by Mega Man and wanted to test him with another robot and hopefully kill Mega Man in the process. Despite the lacking presentation, the dumb twist, and the fact that King is this nothing character with 50 seconds of screen time, there was an interesting concept here. King was motivated by liberating robot masters from fighting over humans, but his position as a robot master means he doesn't have the actual power to rebel against anything. He was programmed by Wily to say and do all that. When he deep down cares for robot kind, but just can't defy programming. It wasn't until Sigma and Mega Man X that a robot had the free will to rebel, and mechs like X and Zero had the free will to fight back against him. But of course, Mega Man's ongoing story is interesting in concept, but you know, the games don't require you to put much thought into it. The Wily stage is the final level, and it houses both the boss rush and the final boss. And you know, this boss rush rant is going to come with the fact that I think this one is one of the worst. It's never going to be as bad as Mega Man X5 or X7, don't get me wrong, but it's still pretty rancid. To explain what makes this one so bad requires some context. In Mega Man 1, the boss rush was done as follows. You fought two of the bosses in Wily Castle 2 and the other four in Wily Castle 4. Mega Man X1 refined this idea by spreading the eight bosses across the first three fortress stages. This was the best boss rush in series history, especially since you could unlock the Hadouken which killed everything in one hit. If you want to talk about player growth, getting past the bosses in one hit is hella satisfying. Every other Mega Man game just plopped the eight bosses in one room before the final boss, and my issue with this has been beaten into the ground. This one is like the worst of all worlds. It's the eight bosses in one stage, but with stage hazards you need to get through in order to fight them all. But it's not simple design like X1's Sigma Palace 3, it's some of the toughest shit in the game. Right after the fight with Cold Man is some of the most demanding disappearing block gameplay you'll ever do in the series, right above some spikes. It can be a real lives drainer, unless you just use the ice wall. But still, my point is that you have to fight to stay alive during this level and then refight all eight bosses. It is quite the gauntlet, and that's coming after the previous level, which already did way too much of that. The final boss is also kind of a dud, too. The attacks in the first phase are easy to avoid and or damage boost through as both characters, and then the final phase is like taking the Mega Man 8 final boss and making it even easier than it already was. The lack of E-Tanks might get you killed, but as base, you just jump up and shoot the magic card weapon, and as Mega Man, you wait for Wily to be low enough to use your charge shot, and it'll be over in no time. Mega Man's story ending with him sad that King is dead, a robot forced to fight against his own will. Only for Roll to tell Mega Man that King is still out there, to which they rejoice. Base's ending sees him scolding Wily for this stupid scheme as Proto Man destroys the blueprints for King Model 2, telling Base that Mega Man always beats him because Mega Man's fighting to protect what he cares about, while Base fights to prove himself better than others. And that's basically it. The credits music being really melancholic, but in a way where I find it a good listen, albeit slightly unfitting in the scenes it's being used for. In conclusion, Mega Man and Base, I think it's a pretty swell game. Look, Mega Man and Base is far from perfect. I never thought it was even close to that in the first place. Mega Man X4 is the perfect game to compare it to, since it had two campaigns with very different characters. In X4, the designers created this perfectly balanced experience between the two protagonists with a consistently solid roster of levels and bosses. That game is near perfection. 
Mega Man and base is comparatively quite messy. I think we can all agree that the game is not well balanced, whether you think this was Bass's game with Mega Man tossed in or a really hard Mega Man game with a base themed easy mode, it's very inconsistent with how it was designed. But I thought the game was fun to play. I loved the music, I thought the challenge was refreshing, I thought the special weapons added a lot to the design, the progression system was new, the shop system had some cool unlockables, I just really like Mega Man and Bass. I think it kinda falls apart in the last two levels, but then I think back on Mega Man's 1 through 8, games I all thought were pretty good to great, and most of them have something I don't like in them, be it a terrible boss rush, Doc Robot, or bad weapons, or some stages being dramatically more difficult than others, a bland set of final levels, and so on and so forth. In fact, looking back at my favorite Mega Man games, I could find issues with most of them. I love Mega Man Zero Two 2 and Zero Four, 4, but I can think of a hundred things I'd change when I replay them. Many of my favorite Mega Man games have less damning issues than Mega Man and Base, but I have no problem saying that despite it being an imperfect game, it's still one I really enjoy. We're talking lower end of the top 10, but it still stands out in my mind, which is why I can identify it as one of my favorites. I like Mega Man 7 more than this, but I'd play this sooner than Mega Man 8, which I enjoyed and played three times for the video. I'd play this before Mega Man 3 or Mega Man 4, games I also enjoyed. Nobody has to agree with anything I'm saying here. Like I said right at the beginning, this defense of Mega Man and base wasn't a response video to anybody because I don't really give a shit. I'm here to tell you why I liked this game and how I've come to enjoy it over the years. And with that statement, I'd like to include another reminder of something I always repeat frequently in my videos, which is always play a game for yourself. You never know what you might think of it. I went into this game with pretty low expectations nine years ago, and I enjoyed it, and still do. Every YouTube game commentator is just a person giving their opinion, but I regularly see, oh, if you watch this video, you'll learn why the game is bad. And I can tell you, every YouTube game commentator is just a person giving their opinion. They're not trying to express their total authority over a subject, because most YouTube game reviewers, like I said, are just people saying what they thought. Some YouTubers in the game space may have more to say because they have game design knowledge and others may just be outraged merchant grifters complaining about DEI or whatever the fuck the thing to be mad about this week is. I'm saying that regardless of all that, you can learn something about your own perspective by listening to what others have to say, but it's never a replacement for playing or watching something yourself. That obviously includes me as well. I'm saying what I thought, but I'm just some dude on the internet. You may play a thing I liked and hate it, or vice versa. That's okay but the only way to have an opinion on something is to try it yourself. Maybe you've played this game on SNES yourself more times than I have and still think it sucks. That's totally fine by me. Differing opinions, when expressed in good faith, should be fine by everybody, which is a satisfactory note to end this video on. Like I said, this is the last Mega Man video I'm doing for a bit, because Mega Man's 7 through base weren't even on my schedule until September, but I bumped it up because you guys enjoyed the Mega Man 6 video and I was like, I'm still in the mood for more Mega Man and went for it. But when I come back to Mega Man towards the holiday season, it'll be for a multitude of classic Mega Man spin-offs. Mega Man's 9 through 11 coming sometime after that. Trust me, the time will fly by. It'll be here before you know it. But to close, I'll say what I always do. If you made it this far into the video, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.